So welcome to this um, uh, session of uh, the Norwich Society Historians Group. We're very happy to uh, welcome Matt Williams with us today, who's going to, to speak to us. Welcome to, to you, Matt. Thank you for coming and accepting to speak to us this morning. Now, Matt is um, a chartered geologist, but who spent 30 years in the construction industry. Not the usual background for, for our speakers, but he is a historian as well. And he's one who's been particularly interested in tracing continuities from past to present, and in particular, how the history of Norwich has been driven by geology. Uh, in earlier talks, we've focused on how individuals have um, influenced uh, the history of our city. We talked in this uh, talk series, we talked about the abolitionists, the suffragettes, uh, and even Will Kemp. Uh, but Matt's going to talk to us about how he feels the fundamentals of our history have always been driven by its geology. Now, he was preparing a book about subterranean Norwich, and more about that later, and in doing so, he became intrigued by the depth and size of some of Norwich's sewers. It's part of a hidden underground system we rely on, but we, we hardly see. Uh, so, see or even think about. So, in his talk today, he's going to be drawing on research made about the sewers in all kinds of uh, sources, uh, both visual and, um, and, and written. And um, having seen uh, a glimpse of what he's going to say, it's absolutely fascinating. So, and Matt, let me turn the time over to you. And uh, thank you again very, very much for coming to be with us this morning. Thank you very much, Michael, and uh, welcome to everyone. Um, I'm hoping this is going to be a bit of a diversion from the slightly miserable times we live in. So welcome to the wacky world of Norwich's sewage system. I must admit, I was originally going to call this talk Norwich down the drain, but uh, somebody pointed out to me this might be misconstrued as the story of what happenings at Carrow Road. So I think we'll stick with the original, the original title. OK, uh, I'm just going to fire up my um, presentation now. So here we are. Um, I hope it's the right date. Yes, I'm in the right place. 150 years of sewage and the reason for making that subject is this year is the exactly 150 years since Norwich got the first public sewage system um, in the city that is. Um, it the exact date was in the middle of August and you may have noticed um, street parties across the city with bunting and people uh, doing synchronized toilet flushing. Um, you might have noticed that but I didn't so um, I think it's, uh, as Michael says, it's something we take for granted, this system. Every time you wash your hands or you flush the toilet, what's happening and what do we rely on and what, what can we, um, what heritage have we got which enables that to happen? This photograph here is actually of New Mills pumping station and, and anyone who uh, knows a little bit about this will point out that this is not 150 years old, but it is the place where I really started to get interested in this whole subject. Um, New Mills pumping station is actually only about 125 years old. But uh, we'll just show you where it is in case you don't know. Um, we're hovering above Grapes Hill. You can see my cursor, which I hope you can. This is Barn Road. This is St Crispin's. This is Westwick Street. This is St Benedict's and Duke Street's over there somewhere. So it's halfway along the river, that stretch of river at the back of Westwick Street. Um, that's New Mills Pumping Station. Important key location in Norwich. And we'll come back to that a little later to explain why. Um, this building is actually uh, 150 years old, exactly. That is Trouse Pumping Station, and that is uh, one of the original buildings of the system, and it survives this day, although as you can see, and it's a slightly sorry state, but its future is looking a little brighter now because it's being talked about as part of the East Norwich Master Plan, which is part of the proposals which will redevelop the Coleman site and the Deal Ground and the utility site, and this has been listed as a sort of heritage asset. So hopefully some future use will be found for this building before it's get decayed any further. Um, if I want a generic picture, I'd choose this one, which is a picture of a sewer being installed under a Norwich street. This is actually at Elsdon Road um, in Norwich, um, just to show the sort of size of stuff that sits down there. It's very disruptive building a thing like that, but once it's all filled in, you just never know it was there. As a geologist, of course, I'm actually interested in even deeper stuff. So let's burrow deep into the ground. And this is a photograph taken under Norwich of some people actually digging a tunnel. Um, if you look at the size of that arch over their head, um, it's quite a big tunnel. So we'll come on to that as well. I 
would like to start by just looking at this map. Now, I don't want you to get, it is slightly confusing at first sight, but it's obviously a map of, of Norwich uh, on which the coloured lines represent some of the sewers I'm going to talk about going through this 150 years up to recently. But I want you to ignore those for a moment and just look at the shape of Norwich. And uh, obviously the middle of Norwich, the medieval core of Norwich sits in this bend in the river, these bends in the river. We've got the River Wensum coming in from the northwest. Um, I hope I hope you can see my cursor. I'm assuming you can, um, and flowing out at the east there. And then around the south side of Norwich, we have the River Yare, which comes and joins the Wensum downstream of the city. And I just, as a geologist, I'm really acutely aware of topography. So we'd better just mention the ups and the downs. And if you this is the highest part of Norwich where I'm circling here on the northwest side, the Thorpe Hamlet area. There the ground rises to about 50 metres above sea level. Uh, on the opposite side of the city, on the southwest side, it rises to about 25 metres above sea level. But in the middle of the city, adjacent to the river, everything is less than five metres above sea level. And in East Anglian terms, this is quite a significant topographic uh, situation and uh, you could almost argue there's a bit of a gorge coming through Norwich here uh, with high ground each side and then as we leave Norwich the valley really opens out so I just need to bear in mind that topography and particularly the fact that it is very low in the middle of Norwich. Okay so I was just putting on this little chat just shows you what I'm not showing you on this map which is the current density of the sewage system which would be really confusing so over time it's built up an awful lot of sewers every road's got a sewer um i'm not going to show you that because we're going to concentrate on the main uh, arteries of this system and we're going to go through sort of chrono chronologically we are going to pop in along the way and have a look at new mills pumping station my favorite building in norwich um and then we will end up probably at the end here I just want to bear in mind what what is the river how does the river relate to the city the original city well obviously the river is really important to why the city is here probably the map the manner by which the first settlers came but you need water for a city uh, so everything started off near to the river but as the city develops of course and especially with industrial processes starting up you're starting to have waste which is finding its way into the river so over time you have to somehow separate the water you're drinking from the water you're using to flush stuff away and over time what tends to happen and in this in Norwich's case um, New Mills was originally the source of various private water supplies up until the first public water supply which predated the sewage system by about 20 years so in 1850 uh, the Norwich Water Company was set up by the great and the good and they acquired higher waterworks in order to extract the water from well on the upstream side of the city so all the stuff going into the river was further downstream from the water intake and then eventually when we get into having a sewage system uh, you're putting the effluent back into the river ideally well downstream so eventually if you look right on the edge here we've got Whitlingham sewage works way downstream so it's that kind of separation which is where the direction of travel, if you like. Um, right, so um, this book, with a bit of a shameless plug for the book, which I managed to get done in time for that August anniversary, the 150th anniversary. Um, this book uh, is, is in, is in Gerald's and in City Bookshop. I'll, at the end, I'll, if you're interested, I'll give you an opportunity of acquiring a, a copy at a discount. But this map is comes from the back of that book. It's a kind of reference map. So you can, whatever sewers we're talking about, you can see exactly where they are on the map. Uh, the book also covers the story of Norwich's water supply, which is a fascinating story, but we haven't got time to do that this morning, so we'll stick to the sewage side. This is a map I like starting talks with. Uh, you may be familiar with this. This is the, the Hutch map. It's a map which was stored in a great hutch, which is a big chest, um, in Great Yarmouth. It's uh, in the town hall. And this is a map which purports to show uh, Norfolk in around the year 1000 AD. And it was a map which was put together at the end of the 16th century by uh, Thomas Dammert, who was a, a, a Lord Mayor of, of, sorry, he was a Mayor of Yarmouth uh, at the end of the 16th century, twice. Um, so he's, this is his view of how, how it looked. And obviously there was an appreciation that much of Norfolk was water. But in order to understand this map, I'll just point out, it's got Norwich on it, on the right-hand side here. 
I'm going to put my uh, my screen point on, I think, so we can see where I'm pointing. So this is Norwich, <coughs> sort of represented on the right hand side of the map. That's a funny place to put Norwich. And the reason is that on this map, north goes downwards. So if we turn it around and put north upwards, we put Norwich back where we'd expect to see it on the left hand side there. And there's a very prominent sand bank here, which is Yarmouth. <laughs> And in the land of Yarmouth, big estuary in what is now the Holdergate Marshes sort of area. But I'm actually going to turn it around again to show the view of Norfolk. If you're coming across the North Sea on a boat, which a lot of people would have been, and starting to find Norwich, we're going to put a bit of perspective on it. And um, we're going to be travelling upstream in a minute. So we're sitting in the estuary looking into these three river outlets. And the one on the left is the Waveney. The one in the middle is the Yare, and somewhere up there is Norwich, and the one on the right is the River Bure. So what we're going to do is um, travel up the river as if we were sailing the boat, and um, eventually uh, we will arrive under the railway swing bridge. We're coming into Norwich now. We will go past Carrow Bridge, go for, past a few more other bridges, then round the corner at Cow Tower, many more bridges, and eventually we come to my favourite place. This is New Mills, and it's a really important location because this is as far as you can get in a boat this is the head of navigation from this point you'd have to haul your boat out and uh transfer into a smaller boat and go further upstream because the river going this direction is going uphill away from us it's obviously flowing towards us um, this is the head of navigation so um this is how it looked uh in the 19th century end of the 19th century this is the original mill, which sat at New Mills, and the, it was called New Mills in 1430 because it replaced the old mills. So it's been there a long time, really important location where there's a big weir and a one and a half metre change in river level. And that change in river level is producing flow of water, which can drive water wheels and much of the city's corn, as you know, was ground there up until uh, the 19th century and at the end of the 19th century it was demolished and new mills pumping station was built let's just go up in the air and look at it if you look from this angle you can see the raised water level at the back uh, this is known as the back river very much a leisure area in the 19th century and then the water pouring through the sluices and on this side we have the water flowing off towards great yarmouth and i just want you to think about levels here it's quite important um, this is virtually sea level and it's tidal in fact uh, if you live in the middle of Norwich you'll notice the wet mark on the side of the river walls it's because the river's going up and down every day on the tide like about half a meter typically but on the upstream side it's still water it's only dictated by the level the sluices are, sluices are set at um, but if you carry on upstream you'll get to a whole series of other weirs and mills about a dozen of them until you get to Fakenham at which level the the river level is actually more than 100 feet above your head so I'm just going to show you this position here with the arrow. A few years ago, uh, I was involved in drilling a borehole there to establish the ground conditions. Now, what I want now to think about is what lies under the ground. I mean, how do you build a thing like this? So this is a little diagram. Um, uh, don't worry about the details, but we're drilling the borehole. And this is a cross section. I want you to look at this scale up the side, which is a scale of meters in relation to sea level. And the OD is sea level. So sea level is in about here, and two meters, four meters. The ground level is about four meters above sea level at that point where the arrow is. This is the borehole we drilled in cross section, and it's it's there's a legend indicating what we found. Uh, just before we look at that, I, I just want you to look at the the right hand side and the river level. So that level, that line there is the river level on the upstream side of New Mills, and that level is the downstream side of New Mills. So the water's falling that height across New Mills. This is the ground. The hatching is built up ground, man-made ground. Some people call it archaeology. Um, so the ground's been built up by, if you look at the scale, about four meters above the original surface, which was virtually at sea level. In fact, it was a gravelly bank on which in the 1400 and something, people decided it would be a good place to try and build a mill. And then we've got another four meters or so of gravel under the ground, and it's saturated ground below the water table. And then this is chalk. So it just gives you an idea, so we've got what we call fill, sand and gravel, and chalk. That is typical for Norwich, and it's uh, key to understanding the story of the sewers. I'm just going to show that another way. We're going to do a slice. We're looking upstream here. New Mills is in the middle here. I'm going to take a slice along the red line 
right from Pottergate, past St Benedict Street, Westwick Street, Duke, Oak Street and Duke Street. And do a little cross section through there. And I've done two cross sections, one showing how it was originally on the upper one, and one showing how it is now. On the upper one, I've marked a red line which shows the present ground level to show you how much buildup there has been since the original natural landscape, um, which was there encountered when probably in Anglo-Scandinavian times when the first people came to Norwich somewhere around 800 AD. We got marsh deposits, then our sand and gravel and then our chalk. But over time, there's been a huge amount of fill added on the top. And the river, instead of it being a braided river with lots of little wiggly channels, it's all been confined into one canal. canal. It's a canalized river with vertical sides. And then buildings have been built right up to the edge. So that's the situation we have. And that's not an untypical situation for the middle of Norwich. And I could go on about that, but uh, you'd have to read the subterranean Norwich book, I guess. Um, right, so that's our geological kind of context. Let's just think about the state of the river. You've probably seen this uh, little map, which appears in um, Carol Wal Walcliffe's uh, edited book about medieval Norwich, uh, or the history of Norwich, and sorry, not medieval Norwich, the later one. And this is a map, again, of uh, the river coming through Norwich, and it records all the kind of pollution things affecting the river in around 1850. Now, 1850 is an important date because it's when it started to be serious moves towards improving the state of the river and the state of the water supply. 1850 was that year that the water company was set up. Uh, it took another 20 years to get a sewage system going. But if you look at these little uh, legend here, D drain P privy S sewer, and then look at the map, you realize just how many things are going into the straight into the river. And of course, a lot of people were using the river directly to obtain their drinking water. This little rectangle here, there are so many in that rectangle, you have to blow it up. So we'll just look at that uh, rectangle, which is immediately downstream of New Mills. And just look at all these drains and privies and sewers. Um, government inspectors were sent uh, and commented back on how Norwich was in danger of becoming um, a cholera uh, centre. Um, I was wrong about the map, actually. The map, this particular map came from uh, Gerald Blizzard's book about uh, Norwich in the 19th century. So this government inspector, William Lee, um, he discovered there were 120 sewers discharging straight into the river. But I want you to remember that at this time, most of the problem in the river was industrial pollution. The reason for that is that the human waste, much of it was being taken out of the city every night in solid form by night soil men. And it wasn't until this, that's an example of Mr. Thomas Crapper's water closet, which uh, this particular one is about 1880, but he, water closets were coming in. As soon as you've got a water supply, you start starting to get people putting water closets in, which immediately means the human waste is being put into the water environment. It's being washed away down the drain and much of that was finding its way into the river. So although Norwich has had a long history of industrial pollution, the problem of pathogens in the river was starting to come in, especially during the 19th century and concentrating people's minds when cholera hit Norwich first in the 1830 and then came back in about 1850s. So what are we gonna do about it? Um, think of the bigger picture with London, uh, the famous London stink, um, Mr. Joseph Bazalget, now, Bazalgette was about, in his work was about 10 years ahead of the Norwich work. Um, he got his sewer going in about 1856, following the big stink, because it particularly affected people sat in the House of Parliament, therefore action was taken. Um, he was asked to look at, to quote uh, for the Norwich scheme. But, you know, we had a situation, this is a view of the, this is the 1883 Ordnance Survey. We're looking along the line of what is now the Inner Ring Road from Barn Road roundabout somewhere here. This is uh, St. Crispin's Road, now plowed straight across here. This is Oak Street. But just look at all these yards uh, crammed with one up, one down cottages. So these people who probably had a big heap of night soil somewhere in the middle of the yard right next to a pump, or maybe they preferred to actually lift their water straight out the river because it might be a bit more pleasant, um, even though it's downstream of the tanning works. So we've got a potential uh, nightmare situation in terms of public health here and people were well aware of this but obviously Norwich was an ancient town and the economy was not particularly good at this time so 
I'm not going to bore you with all the long and tortuous details of how Norwich finally decided to build its first sewage system, but it did take quite a few years. As I say, uh, it wasn't until the 1860s, late 1860s, really. Uh, there's a lot of argument. There were a lot of people around um, who were arguing that we, sh we shouldn't be doing this because it would put up taxes and, and, and poor people should be able to have clean water free. They shouldn't have to pay for clean water and pay for sewage services and um, all the usual kind of things you probably see in a, in a modern form. But um, it was designs are finally worked up. Joseph Basil gets submitted one, which was vastly more money than the city corporation wanted to spend. They kind of cloned bits of it. They got other people to look at it. But eventually what actually triggered this was the town or the village, I mean, of Thorpe St Andrew, the suburb of Thorpe St Andrew, the village, uh, actually took Norwich to the Court of Chancery because they were fed up with having an open sewer running through their village. And the uh, court found in their favour and Norwich Corporation had to do something. So in March 1868, they took out a £60,000 loan and quickly appointed a contractor, Mr Thomas Wainwright, to get on and start building the system. Now, this is the system they decided on. It, as I say, it is quite influenced by some of Basilgate's ideas, although Basilgate was working on the other side of the river. But we basically got a low level sewer running initially close to the river. And the point of that sewer, it's got to catch all the stuff which would otherwise be flowing from pipes straight into the river. So it has to be built at river level. And that sewer has to take the sewage out of the city centre where it collects in Trouse pumping station. And that's why the pumping station was built, because from there, the sewage has to then be pumped up a hill to land at Crown Point, which at that time was owned by Robert Harvey. And he did a deal with this corporation. Um, he would pay for the company pumping costs if they provided him with lots of lovely sewage, which he could irrigate his farm with, uh, and obviously um, full of nutrients. So that was the original scheme. Um, and then tapping into that, we had a high level sewer, which was being built to service all the growing suburb of Norwich on the southwest side, um, particularly all the posh houses down Newmarket Road. And that actually fed into the city and then joined the low level sewer at King Street. So that was the, the plan. And uh, they get up, got on and told Thomas Wainwright to get on and, and build it. Now, these are the sizes, the typical size of the sewer, you know, four, four feet, six feet diameter. And at that time, everything was built in brickwork. And then cross section, there were these, this egg shape, which was sort of a well-established design principle in the 19th century. The point about the egg shape means that if you don't have much sewage in there, you don't have much cross sectional area. So it still flows. If you have a circular without much sewage in it, that it would, there would be very hard to make it flow because this has to work by gravity. And that is a fundamental thing you need to understand about the sewage system here. And the problem is we've got a river flowing through Norwich, which is virtually flat. It's virtually sea level. It's very sluggish, quite apart from anything else. It means if you do discharge stuff into the river, it probably comes back on the next tide. But if you're building a sewer, you have to collect all the sewage at river level, because that's where it's coming in, but then run it by gravity in your sewer to Trous. So that sewer had to be built running downhill. And by the time it gets to Trouse, it's 17 feet below sea level. Fair enough, you might say. Mr. Raymite started, and this, I'll put this picture up. You probably recognize this is the Norwich Arts Centre, which is St. Swithin's Church, as it is today. One of the, after a few months, Mr. Wainwright had a slight hiccup in that he was building a sewer down this alleyway, which is St. Swithin's Alley. And um, unfortunately, um, the, uh, the tower of the church, there it is, this photograph dates from the 1860s, the tower of the church had to be taken down because they undermined it. Medieval church tower fell down during Stuart construction. Not a good advert, but he, he persisted for a few more months. But basically, after three or four months, he threw in the towel. And he threw in the towel, citing unsuitable ground conditions. And the unsuitable ground conditions arise from our geology here. We've got saturated sands and gravels. Imagine trying to dig a hole in saturated sand and gravel, way below the water table. And even when you get to the chalk, I don't think it's any coincidence that the word Norwich rhymes with the word porridge, 
because that's what it's like you try and dig in wet chalk so trying to get into the ground in a tunnel probably without compressed air in 1860s to send men down there to lay brickwork to build a sewer is not an easy task so he walked away to the city's credit they had no option but to take it over themselves and after another two years they got it built don't ask me how they got it built uh, quite a major achievement so by 1871 we had essentially this system in place and when we return to our map in a minute you'll see those are the red lines on the map we had new mills pumping station quite a substantial construction full of lovely victorian engineering people love that kind of thing it's not now it's it's an empty void unfortunately but we had large steam powered beam engine designed to pump sewage uphill out of a sump about 140 feet vertically it had to be pumped to get up to crown point there's a the photograph taken inside with all the usual ornate stuff um i would love to know what happened to all that in cross section you can see that that is a pretty mighty big building when you look at it above ground but there's almost as much below the ground because there's a big sump which has to collect all this sewage I'm just going to move that map up and I want you to look at the bit I'm highlighting in yellow, which is the low level section of the sewer. This is the bit which is most problematic because we're starting off at river level and trying to construct a sewer downhill from there. And um, in cross section, you can see we're going from Riverside Road. This route goes from Riverside Road and it crosses under the river near Foundry Bridge. It then goes up Rose Lane. It then turns a left into King Street and goes the full length of King Street, still going downhill all the way. And even where it goes up to Brackendale, it's still going downhill. So by the time, to get that, the time you get to that top corner, Brackendale, that sewer is about 40 feet below ground level. There's a manhole cover, you're going to have 40 feet to get the sewer. And this is it in cross section all the way down. And you can see we've got the scale of meters above, AOD stands for above ordnance data. It's the same as above sea level. The blue is the water table. So we're trying to build this thing under the water table, but they did it somehow. Don't ask me how. But the problem is this. This is a picture inside the sewer, and you can see the water leaking in through the brickwork. It's leaking in from the ground into the sewer. Um, and you might say that's not a big problem. It's nice, lovely clean water, groundwater. It is a big problem because right from day one this system which was designed to handle two and a half million gallons a day was hand having to handle five million gallons a day which meant that the pumping station couldn't hardly cope with it they had to run the the pumps twice the speed and they wore out much faster um, furthermore bits of the brickwork were crumbling and starting to move a bit because there's nothing substantial that they were built against oh dear um various attempts were made to deal with this this is a diagram showing some iron plates which were inserted we they basically we had 20 years or so following construction of norwich be, acquiring a reputation as the happy hunting ground of the nation's civil engineers and all the big noises nationally were coming to norwich to try and help norwich with this problem and they included Basilgate, not surprisingly having not won the original quote his uh, recommendation was to scrap the whole thing and start again. Um, other engineers like Hawksley um, came and, and recommended lining it with plates, strutting it in places, which is a problem because it obstructs the sewage. And they sort of bodged and bodged and bodged over a number of years. And eventually, I think by the time we got to the 1880s, the city corporation just decided they had to live with it. And that involved having to clean the sewer out from the city centre at intervals into barges and take the stuff out of the out of the city bit of a sad tale direct result of the geology and the topography and if this was london they probably would have got away with it because you would be building in london clay which is a lovely sticky clay which seals the water off but chalk and gravel don't do that so that's the story of the first sewer and takes us through to the 1890s when eventually we had an answer and this was the answer this is a piece of technology invented by isaac Schoen, and um mr Schoen came up with a thing called the Schoen ejector and what it is is basically something you put in the ground which takes the sewage in and then you add compressed air 
And when this chamber fills with sewage, you let the, the, it triggers a valve which sends a huge pulse of compressed air, which forces the sewer out of this side up to a higher level. So you can lift the sewage from here to here. It's great invention. You have to have a source of compressed air. But if you put this thing at intervals along your sewer, it means we could actually scrap the original sewer, the problematic one, build another sewer at a higher level and get the sewage down the same route for it having gravity between the shown ejectors, but not ever going to, having to build it below the water table. And the city decided to go for that. Um, and this is a little model of the shown ejector, which um, is actually sitting in New Mills pumping station. And this, I don't want to show you this picture. It's actually, this is from a little bit later, about 30 years later, but I'm just, this is a shown ejector being installed in the corporation depot at Westwick Street. We're looking diagonally across towards Iam Street. Westwick Street's behind this building. This is Barn Road. That's the corner. And if you know your Norwich, you'll probably just recognize that half timbered building there, which is the Monkey House, which is a timber frame building moved to that point from Whitney Marshes in the early 1900s. Um, subsequently destroyed in the Second World War. But anyway, this is a 35 feet high chamber, which is being sunk entirely into the ground, which I think is a spectacular piece of engineering. This was actually from the 1930s. We'll come back to that very shortly. So this is the shown ejector. I hope you understand how it works. It's like one-way valves and it's using compressed air to force the sewage uphill. And this is where New Mills Pumping Station comes in because this building was built to provide the compressed air. The original idea is the compressed air would be produced by uh, using a steam boiler with backup from river power, which is why um, this building was put over the, over the river at the position of the new mills. As it turned out, they discovered that the river power was actually sufficient for most of the time to produce all the compressed air they needed. And then the compressed air was being pumped from this point to all of the shown ejectors, all six of them, dotted around the city centre, it's being pumped down a nine inch pipe. And it was completed in 1897. This is where the shown ejectors were, if you're interested, the map from the, from the book. Uh, at each point, they're taking sewage at a lower level and raising it so that you can use gravity to get it to move on the original route. Um, and cross section, this is just an amazing piece of engineering. Um, this is a cross section through New Mills pumping station. There's the upper river level, there's the lower river level. And what it's got is these turbines, uh, vertical turbines. So the water falls through them, turns the turbine, and with gearing turns this wheel, which drives a piston backwards and forwards, and pressurizes the air, which is then stored in a tank. We turn 90 degrees and look at the same cross section. These, this axle's going round and it's driving these four compressors, two for each turbine, and pumping the air down this pipe into the big tank, which sits at the end there. And that's looking from that angle. And uh, if you like, I'm going to take you in and have a quick look at New Mills. This is a bit of a diversion. This is my, my favourite place. So this is a view of what it looks like inside. I think I'll park my bike in there. I'm actually going to play you a little bit of video, uh, just showing what it's like in there with sound effects. The sound effects is the roar of the water that we're looking at. I'm not kidding. All this stuff is still sitting in there. You can see the four compressors. This is there's two type turbines under here and there's the pipe and there's the big tanks at the end that the air is being pumped into and it's still there today. Uh, this building has been completely unused since um, or at least 25 years. Um, but now we're looking at that angle. Just going to indulge me, show you one other video from the back of the building looking the other way. I'm looking back towards the door we came in and this time I'm going to actually um, you can see the pipe coming across there, the tanks are on my extreme left. I'm going to take you and look down this little plate in the floor just to see what sits under New Mills Pumping Station. There it is, and you can actually see one of the vertical turbines still in place. There's a lot of power available there. It's gone completely to waste for the last few years. That power amounts to something like um, 35, 40 brake horsepower per turbine or in kilowatt terms, the whole, those two turbines are capable of producing about 75 kilowatts, 24 seven, it's been entirely wasted. There's one of the bits of turbine lying in the shrubbery. There's a cross section, we won't bother about that, let's move on. I just want to show you a picture of the original steam boiler, which was built, it was called a refuse destructor. 
um, and it was taking domestic refuse, 19th century refuse, and burning it to produce, produce steam to drive the uh, compressors. But in fact, they gave up with it because they had all the problems with it. But one of the problems was how you get how do you get the stuff tipped in from down there up to the top there? And they constructed this elaborate lifting arrangement. The other problem was the variable calorific value of the refuse, but they discovered there was enough compressed air in the river at that time. It subsequently had electric motors and things added to it as Norwich's sewage system expanded. So I just want you to understand the role of new mills there. There it is, um, looking from the upstream side. If you spot on the end of the building, there's an extension. Look at this original photograph. There wasn't an extension. They've, it's been extended in the 1930s, which is the next story we're going to talk about. There's the extension, looking from the downstream side. And we're just going to quick look in there. It's got a floor added it now. It's full of stuff on the wall. There's a little plaque showing when it was extended in 1936 for this other sewage scheme we're about to talk about. A nice commemorative plaque. But I just want to show you this that I stubbed my toe on in there. This lump of stone here turned out to be the original flood plate that sat on the wall next to the well-known flood plate at Westwood Street, uh, New Mills Yard. The original stone plate, which had all these Norwich flood levels on, then they made this metal one to go next to it. And in fact, um, there it is in George Plunkett's famous photograph with Jonathan Plunkett stood there for scale. Uh, the interesting thing for me is this was the second metal flood plate because the first one they put in, um, a photograph here from 1912. The first metal flood plate they put in to replace the stone one was not tall enough to deal with the 1912 flood, so they must replace that one with that one. And then subsequently they took the stone one away. And in fact, the plate sits on a 1980s wall now, but I, it is actually at the correct level, I'm pleased to say. But this original relic here, which could easily have gone in a skip, is sitting in numerous pumping station, and I will be distraught if that ever disappears. Uh, there was a when the new mills pumping station actually was stopped working in the early 1970s, about 10 years later, a restoration project was started. Um, just about read the new mills uh, charitable trust uh, with people like uh, Norman Peake um, and a lot of sponsorship. It eventually failed around 2000. The future new mills is uncertain and it really worries me. Uh, one of the reasons is it's got all this sluice gear on the back uh, managed by Angry Mortar and uh, the intention is to do away with that, build another sluice somewhere else. And the Environment Agency want to produce a more natural flow back in the river and do away with the weir. And a few years ago, you may have noticed they did an experiment to actually open all the sluices and um, see what the river looked like. And it basically was a bit of a muddy mess. And I was worried about some of these walls falling over. I only did it for two days. I haven't heard anything recently, but um, we'll see what happens there. But uh, I, it's owned by the City Council, New Mills. Um, I think, not sure they're entirely sure they own it, and if they consider it more of a liability than an asset, but it must have a future. Okay, so let's get back to our story. We've uh, talked about this red line, the original sewage system. Uh, the pumping main went up um, Kirby Beden Road and then did a left uh, somewhere near Trumpery Lane across to the farm. It wasn't a sewage works as such in those days. 1930s, we got this big extension and Norwich was rapidly expanding and the, the city council were putting social housing in, or would be called that in those days, council estates in the West Earlham area especially. And it had to have sewage because by this time it was recognized you can't build a house, hundreds of houses all with their own cesspit. And it was also recognized that the surface water off the roofs and the roadways was relatively clean and could find its way to the river. So the idea was to split those two systems, the foul system and the stormwater system. So we're going to look at the blue line. The thick line is the foul sewer. And um, originally they wanted to build a sewage works on the river, but that would have been upstream of the waterworks and they were forbidden for doing that. So they came up with another idea. And um, basically to connect that sewer right into the city centre at New Mills or Westwick Street. And there's a slight snag there. I've just put a picture there, which is you're hovering above Deer Road now, looking back towards the city. This is Deer Road. Let's just blow that up. Sorry, it's a bit blurred. We're hovering above the point where the sewage is being collected from West Earlham. How do you get it from there to Westwick Street over there? Well, the last bit, you can run a big pipe in a trench down Higham Street, but how do you get to Higham Street? Because there's a basic problem, there's a big hill in the way, a very big hill there, as you're probably aware, in the Stone Hills area. 
and they decided to tunnel under it right under the right under the waterworks in fact on this sort of line and there's a photograph that putting the sewer in a tunnel it actually goes underneath the reservoirs a long way down in the chalk i just think it's amazing bit of engineering and bear in mind it's gravity and it has to run downhill all the way and they had probably just a few meters a very few meters of fall to get the sewage from helsden road near the gatehouse pub through to westwick street so you've got a constant gradient all the way and that was done in 1930s uh, private contract uh, to cost and it, it was completed. So we've now got the foul sewage connected into the city system, the red system, but they had to build a whopping great um, uh, shown ejector at that point. That's the picture I showed you. I'll just show that again in a minute. But I just also wanted to highlight this thin line is the surface water. I had to get it from here into the river, but the authorities wouldn't let them discharge it into the river because of it being upstream of the waterworks. So they had to get it under the river near the gatehouse pub, Helston Road, and then through a ditch system in the marshes, and then it eventually goes back into the river near the Dolphin Bridge. So getting a five foot diameter sewer under the river is quite an interesting exercise. You have to build a big slot, do it in two bits, and by the time it's finished, the riverbed is not obstructed. That's how it looks today. You'd never realize that was there. That's another megabit of engineering for you. Okay, so we're connected in, and then as I say, we build a shown ejector at the point that's what that was built for and if you're interested in where that is it's just about there now this is Westwick Street car park which uh, is currently uh, a Covid testing station this is where I start wandering around Norwich looking at manhole covers because if you look carefully there there's some lovely old manhole covers which are probably the manhole covers of that particular 35 feet tall metal thing sitting there under the ground which is it survived for 30 years or so Okay, we better move on. Early 1950s, we've de dispensed with the Second World War. A lot of attention is obviously on rebuilding more damage and so on. But by the time we got to the 1950s, lots more council houses being built, especially on the south side of the city. Tuxwood area, Lakenham area, all that. And it was realized that we we're actually moving out of the city, getting over the watershed. This is a big hump of ground here because everything on this area drives drains into the Wensum, but as you get further over, everything naturally drains into the air. So they said, let's look at the orange line. Let's build a sewer running all the way around the Yare Valley and connecting to Trous that way, and then drain all our foul sewage that away, away from the city, down a natural slope, and then obviously intercept it before it gets into the river. And that's what they did. Uh, and this was done as a, an in-house construction by the post-war council. Um, Bit of a bold move, the government doesn't like you doing that kind of thing because of competitive tendering and all that, but they did it and um, blow it up a little bit so you can see it. There's a sewer running all the way around there. There's a photograph of it being built. This is a still from a, a council film they made at the time with all these council employed people putting in large diameter sewer in trenches. Uh, all must have been a dreadful mess, especially on the marshes. But you wouldn't know it's there now, apart from anyone who walks their dog down Marston Marshes, for example, or, or Ellen Park even, you see these big manhole covers stood up. And the reason they were built like that, there's another one right over there, they're built like that so that when the river floods, you don't get the danger of the sewage mixing with the river water. A uh, bit of an ugly thing, but that's what they are. So there's a bit, it must be a massive drag line trench across here in all this mud and the stuff to build that. The city were emboldened by that because they had an even more ambitious scheme because we we're thinking about the north side of the city or expansion in that area. Are we really going to drop all that sewage into this city centre system, which was starting to get a bit over overloaded, particularly because it depended on all these shown ejectors? So we're now going to look at the purple line, and this is the mighty northwest interceptor sewer. And the idea is to collect the sewage from the north of the city and to run a sewer all the way around on this line and all the way around past New Mills, but all the way under the inner ring road, all the way under Grapes Hill, all the way under Chapelfield, Queen's Road, Brackendale, all the way down to Trous there. Moreover, it was going to be a gravity sewer. This is a monstrous sewer, uh, given the amount it had to be designed for. The idea was to basically take everything coming in on this side of the city, on the west and north side of the city, and the inner parts of the south side of the city. 
So we're just going to quickly look at that one. This is a sewer where I bend down and I put my ear against that. And you can hear the sewage running underneath. This is in Wensum Park. The sewer runs right through Wensum Park under here. Again, it must have been a terrible mess because that was put in a trench. Um, but what I'm going to do is just show you a cross section. This is a cross section along the length of the Northwest Interceptor, which is about four and a half miles in total. I'm just going to put that horizontal. So we're going from the Wenton Park area. The sewer is going downhill all the way. There's a little step there, all the way down to Trous. And you may spot it at the ground level. Once you get to the Barn Road, Grapes Hill goes up. The sewer is still going downhill. And it goes even higher when it's time to get to Brackendale. So that sewer is an awful long way down. I'm going to turn this round, actually, because I can't put the, the writing back the other way. So we're going from right to left now, just to see that. And I just want you to look at the scale of this thing. This is the the upper end where the sewer is not particularly large diameter. It's a few feet. This is uh, at the area of the back of Oak Street as the sewer comes through. It runs parallel to the river, not far uh, down the slope from Oak Street. Um, but bear in mind where the water table is. The water table is about this level. Um, the sewer incidentally also has to cross the River Wensum. <laughs> uh, so much of the sewer, the lower bit of the sewer is below the water table. So involved, this time we had compressed air. We also had concrete, concrete segments, which meant that you could seal them well and hopefully keep the water out. That arrow there shows you the point at which the sewer is at the greatest depth below ground level. And that depth uh, is actually, uh, somewhere I've got it written down, 124 feet, 38 meters. So if you lift the manhole cover in Brackendale to that sewer, you're looking down at a sewer which is 38 meet, meters, 124 feet down via a series of landings. That's an awful deep sewer. Um, they had a, a few issues. Uh, it kind of was running very close to the old sewer as it went down Brackendale. They actually hit it at one point. This is, uh, you, we've seen pictures of tunnel shields building the Channel Tunnel and the Crosslink in London these days, but this is a tunnel shield which is being lowered down a shaft at the bottom of Grapes Hill, and you might recognise the building in the background at the junction of uh, Grapes Hill and Durham Road. So the lower part of the sewer all had to be built in tunnel. The upper bit was all done in open trench, the lower bit was all in tunnel. So there are the guys going down a shaft, one of the shafts in Grapes Hill area. This is a bit of a blurred clip from, as you can see, the East Anglian Film Archive. There's some city council films, rather blurred, showing in the 1950s when this was built, late 50s, 57, guys with absolutely no protective equipment, no helmets, no masks. They were most of them are smoking. They've all got Teddy Boy hairstyles. They're literally digging at the face in the chalk, digging at the face, shoveling all the chalk into this these little trucks because they had a rail system to pull the trucks out and lift the trucks out from the shafts and take all that chalk away. It was actually a huge amount of talk because this tunnel is eight feet diameter under Grapes Hill. After the it's been dug, it gets lined with these concrete interlocking concrete segments which are bolted together. And then those have a brick lining put inside them to create a smooth surface for the, the, the sewage to run on. You can see the scale of the tunnel. Absolutely huge construction. 12 hour shifts. Okay, so that was the Northwest Interceptor, the purple one. We're getting there. Come the late 1960s, we had one other bit of the city not catered for, which is the whole east side of the city. And historically, our red sewer was where all those connections went, but it, as I say, it was getting overloaded. So the aspiration is to create, create another sewer on the east side. And before they got too far down the line, they realized that there were at least two sewers already on that sort of line. Why not reuse that redundant sewer, which was trashed in the 1890s, if only they knew where it was and they could find it? I think that's a pretty bold decision, but apparently it was going to save about a quarter million pounds. And uh, it was a, a privately run a net project, this one. It was a Magoni type thing. So I'm just going to superimpose on this map a map which was from this 1960s this scheme on the same line, showing the line of that sewer, the one that came down Riverside Road, Rose, Rose Lane, King Street, all the way down to Trouse that way. Notice it does a dog leg around the Coleman site because uh, originally in the 1870s, Mr. Joseph Coleman, uh, sorry, Jeremiah Coleman, he didn't want 
sewers going across his common site because that was about the time he was putting his deep abstraction laws down. So when we look at that little map, the interesting thing, this map from 1960s uses the original labels of the manholes of the original 1870s scheme. So Miss Martineau's manhole, uh, Cinder Oven's manhole, etc. And these numbered manholes on the line. The problem was they couldn't find them initially and they had to do a lot of detective work to do that, both a paper study work. And also, interestingly, they discovered that the one to 500 scale Auden survey had recorded manhole covers, which is 1883, uh, which helped them tell them where in the road this sewer was. So they did that. Uh, they also had to send divers down, not just to try and find sewers, but to clean the whole lot out because it's completely full of sludge and leaking like a sieve. This diver is going down a manhole at the top corner of Brackendale King Street. So I'm talking about there somewhere. And uh, I managed to talk to one of these divers or somebody who had that information. So this was the situation they were faced with, except they had to clean out all the sludge first. And then come the 1960s, we had the technology to grout in through the brickwork to seal off the water as best we could, and then line the whole thing with concrete segments and get it going again. So this is the original 1870 sewer. They got it going again in the 1960s after it being out of action for 70 years. And as far as I know, it still runs. So that is now been redesignated the Riverside Intersecting Sewer. So we've now got, that's the yellow dash, yellow dash line I put on there. So it's now, we've got the capacity to take the sewage coming this way. This one, or this is coming down the Northwest Interceptor. They then, by, I forgot to say that the, yes, the blue one was connected in eventually to the Northwest Interceptor. So that's when that uh, Schroen ejector at Westwick Street was decommissioned. So we've got everything catered for. And then from there, everything just gets massively expanded. Just briefly looking at the route from Trouse to Whitgham. The original one was this red one. In the 19th century, that was replaced with a route that goes under Whitlingham Lane, basically, through what is now Whitlingham Park. And then come the 1960s, 1970s, when there was a major, major upgrade to the treatment works. I, just to explain that the original sewage farm, which was Robert Harvey's farm, well, Robert Harvey shot himself a couple of years later because he was bankrupt. Um, his estate was split up and the city council bought some of that land to build what became known as a sewage farm. And then over the years, it became a treatment works and it kind of made, migrated over and it's now a very big site on a convenient slope, which enables you to run everything by gravity, um, infinitely expandable. And it's treating the water and discharging the clean water back into the river. Uh, and in the 1970s, a new route was put, a more direct one, straight the way through the middle. But uh, there are some bits of the original sewer at this end and that became a big problem because uh, in 2019, <laughs> They discovered major problems with some of this sewer. Now, I rem remember the original sewage volume was, four, it was two and a half million gallons a day. By this point in time, this system is taking over 40 million gallons a day. Um, and that is, if you want to try and get a handle on that, that is 2,200 litres every second. That is a lot of sewage. And they had to actually provide a bypass to shut that off to enable them to repair the sewer. Anyway, it was done. I won't bore you with all the developments that the sewage works itself, but it's got very big and a series of processes and it outfalls down this line here into the river, just downstream of the POSIC viaduct. And um, that is where we've got to. There's a lot of other things I could talk to you about stormwater sewers. There's much more detail in the book. So um, there's the outfall into the river, which you, that's the view you get as you sail past. And lots of lovely clean water going to restore the, um, the flow in the river. Because the basic problem is we're sucking the water out upstream of the river, running it through our dishwashers and putting it back into the river downstream of Norwich. So there's a danger that the flow in Norwich, which has been a problem, is not very much now. But at least from downstream of Norwich, we got the water back into the system to support all the sort of boardroom habitats, hopefully in a reasonably clean state. I'm not going to comment too much about that. Um, so that's as far as I want to go in this talk. I hope you found that interesting to get the sort of context of the history. And um, just to finish with, I need to mention a few uh, people I need to uh, thank. Um, 
it's been very difficult getting this information together. Uh, when I did the book, I had a lot of cooperation and help on the water side from angling water, but I couldn't find anyone who was prepared to tell me or even knew about the history of development of the sewage side. Just to explain that the sewage side was originally a city corporation, and then in the um, in the night in, in Thatcher's time in the 1980s, it was obviously privatised. Um, and uh, it's the same company looks after both the water side and the sewage side, whereas previously they were totally different. There was a water company, and then there was the city council dealing with the sewage. But uh, I, I I had to glean whatever I could find. I had various individuals who helped me with stuff. I got a little bit of information from brochures um, at various stages, commemorative brochures, but a lot of it is walking around looking at manhole covers, um, photographs. Uh, there is a certain amount from lodged, particularly to do with the shown system, uh, Institution of Municipal Engineers. But I was very reliant on a, um, the archive of the Industrial Archaeology Society, um, work originally by Barry Funnell and uh, well, originally by RJ Britt actually and, and assimilated by Barry Funnell which helped piece together this story so I hope you found that um, interesting um, it was nice talking to a guy that actually gave me his journey under knowledge down the sewers um, and a lot of individuals who had their own memories so I've tried to piece that together into some sort of form which I hope you will find interesting and informative as you walk around topographic knowledge or even when you just uh, run the tap so there's my um email contact any feedback any information you have obviously i'd love to hear from you um it's also the email address where i'm anybody attending this talk uh during 2021 up to the end of the year i'm very happy to let them have uh, a copy of the book at a discount and if you live in norwich i, I can uh, get that hand delivered by the end of the year um if you live further afield, we might have to send it and I might have to charge postage. But the book actually sells for £10, shelf price, 20% um, discount for anybody who contacts me on that email address by the end of the year. OK, I think I've got the end of that. So I'll um, undo my share and um, hand back to Michael. Thank you for your attention. Right. Thank you, uh, Matt. That, uh... I never thought I'd find sewage so so interesting. Um, for um, for everybody, um, you can, if you have questions, and Matt is very happy to answer them. Uh, down at the bottom of your screen, if you hover down with your cursor, you'll see something that says Q and A. Um, just click on that, and you can uh, type in uh, a question, which I can then um, uh, pass on on to Matt. We've had one to two questions, and um, the first one uh, looks to the future and it says, is the Norwich sewage system resilient enough to handle the planned expansion of the next 15 years? I mean, to answer that now, yes. Um, the answer to that question is we have spent uh, over 100 years having this separation of stormwater and foul water. And it's a bit of an artificial separation because the decision to go for water closets has put everything into the water environment. So you've got to have two, a completely dual system. The future involves doing away with that dichotomy and going back to having just water and obviously cleaning the water up as appropriate. So I'm not kidding. The strategic plan here is to create an orbital sewer right around the edge of the city and to use it to collect everything at uh, to collect all the sewage at um, Whitlingham, where there is a lot of space to do further expansion, but to clean it up there and to put it back into the drinking water system. Um, so you might be uh, worried about using sewage water as drinking water, but a lot of cities do that. And uh, I have to point out that Norwich is on the River Wensum, and further up the River Wensum is a sewage works which caters for Fakenham. <laughs> so, so it's a question of uh, having cleanup technology. Um, the interesting thing for me is that there's been a long-term progression of moving the water intake further and further upstream, which has been reversed in recent years. They've brought the water intake from Cossie Pits back to Norwich again in recent years. It was moved up to Cossie Pits to get it upstream of May and Baker's chemical factory. Um, and so there's obviously a certain amount of confidence we can clean the water up. But on the other hand, the micro pollutants coming into the water environment now are our worry 
um, because you have to have more and more processes and the water we drink uh, is as I say it's thoroughly clean and, and healthy but it's been through many many processes with all sorts of chemical additions and filters and this and that but as I say the future may be uh, and of course we've got the other factor is new houses are going to have to be built with grey water systems so they're using rainwater to do the things you don't need drinking water for for example flushing toilets it just seems crazy every time you pull a handle to put a couple of gallons of perfectly potable water down the toilet just to wash the sewage away that is an absurd thing to do but the future as i say is to try and have a more rational system what worries me is that it is a very carbon intensive industry Angry Water have made a lot of efforts to try to reduce the carbon load into the atmosphere of running their system because there's a lot of pumps running it's like that that moving the water into back into Norwich saved a huge amount of carbon but uh, construction is an even more carbon intensive industry so we've got massive infrastructure this fantastic legacy from the past which involved copious amounts of carbon dioxide being dumped into the atmosphere going forward we've got to somehow create infrastructure without the same effect that's the challenge thank you another question uh, from Catherine says um, at New Mills Yard, there are old rails running from the building across the path to the river. I've often wondered about these before. Can you shed any light? Certainly. Um, if I was confident tinkering with my computer, I'd put a screenshot up for you. But if you go to the Norfolk Mills website and look for New Mills, there is a photograph on there, which I had kind permission to include in the book. Um, but it, it answers that question. New Mills is the head of navigation. It is the logical place for an interchange between wherries and railways. So you're quite right, there are rail lines. It was a siding which ran from the city station, which as you know, stood on where the Barn Road roundabout is now. An extension of those sidings into New Mills to enable uh, agricultural produce to be tipped from trucks into wherries. And at the point where you see those rails going uh, pa past the path, basically onto the downstream side of the mill, there was a timber pontoon built out there, which enabled trucks to be emptied vertically into wherries, and then the wherries take the the, um, the stuff away. Presumably, it worked in both directions. Um, I saw some guys repairing that path a few years ago and putting tarmac all over those rails and I asked them oh, please leave a bit because it's a fantastic piece of heritage. it's one of those wonderful bits of Norwich heritage I'm not I'm not somebody buys into the idea that Norwich consists of 10 iconic buildings Norwich consists of lots of little details and that's one of them and they didn't know what they were doing but they they said okay we'll leave it a bit uncovered but no doubt some future contractor will come and take that out as there are lots of things like that same with tram rails in fact mm -hmm. when they um they were repairing the north, the, the riverside interceptor sewer under riverside. They discovered it was the construction of the tram system which finally led to the demise for that sewer under Riverside Road, didn't they? So uh, that, you know, that's that's the answer to the question anyway. It was um, there was definitely rail lines, and if you want to see the way it worked, look for that photograph on the Norfolk Mills website. Uh, so, uh, Stephen adds something to uh, a little tidbit. He says, in addition to your talk, uh, the triple manhole cover at the bottom of Bridewell Alley is on top of the cocky. The inspection chamber had to be deepened and expanded when built, as the course of the cocky was different to that on BT's map. I can comment on that. Yeah, uh, very mm -hmm. interesting. Thank you for that information. Um, there's a lot of argument about cockies, well, for a potential argument. I, I, I'm a geologist. I'm looking at the ground. The ground is permeable. I do not accept that Norwich in historic times has had flowing natural watercourses because the water just soaks into the ground. What we're looking at with a cocky is actually a drain. It's a, it's a, a topographic feature which would have originally been flowing when the ground was frozen 15,000 years ago, thus eroding the valley. It's then dry when the city's first settled, but as the city develops, you have a lot of surface water to dispose of, and the drain, this becomes act, reactivated as a drain on the line of the valley. Whether it is actually the cocky is kind of debatable. Uh, I drill boreholes in that part of in that area, and um, yeah. The, the root is, you're talking about the root of the drain, which is sort of in the valley of an original thing, but 
because you've got water under the ground everywhere in Norwich, um, the groundwater table is pretty well at river level across the whole of Norwich. It does rise slightly away from Norwich. At a higher level, you've got ground which is permeable, and if you throw water on it, it's still going to soak in. So yes, there were there were cockies. There's a lot of they're not sort of single roots. They're basically thing things which intercept waters in the ground anywhere in places and get activated either by human activity or obviously during really heavy weather. Um, the one which makes me laugh, it's the, the line of blue tiles going down Whistlegate, which has actually got a label on it saying, this is the course of the Great Cocky. It's entirely wrong from even the historic evidence, which we can look at parish boundaries and those other things, but the, the Cocky is actually completely <laughs> Uh, the other side of uh, John Lewis, it runs down the back of Surrey Street, the one we know about, the historic one. So, uh, good, good attempt, but completely mm -hmm. false. But I don't, I don't. I, you, Norwich is not like a limestone country where you get underground rivers. The concept of underground river doesn't exist because you've got a, basically a water table, and if you intercept the water table, you will find water. And that's probably what happened during that manhole mm -hmm. thing. Added to the fact that the valley in the Bridewell Alley area has been hugely filled in. There's four or five metres of archaeology in the infill of the cocky. The, the cocky came out in the river at the back of the Norwich Story car park next to the Duke's Palace, where he used to moor his luxury yacht. But the cocky was at that river level on the south side of St Andrews as well. So it's been hugely filled in as a causeway across the cocky, a medieval causeway under the road on St Andrews Street. Mm -hmm. Question about the future. What are the chances of another 1912? Just, I feel like I'm just doing shameless plugs for books, but the, the, my the follow up to my subterranean Norwich book is a book called Norwich Submerged, and it completely tackles that question. Norwich, the 1912 flood was first and foremost a completely freak. Well, and in its day, it was a freak meteorological event. Um, it was a fluvial flood. It's nothing to do with Norwich's position at the head of the estuary. It was a fluvial flood in the late August with a lot of water coming down the river. New Mills pumping station played a major role because at that time, indeed, at the time of the previous flood, which was 1878, Cushion's timber yard was there then. And all the timber from the timber yard floated away and bunged up the sluices in New Mills and stopped the river flowing. And there, that's where the worst flooding took place. So, Going forward, yes, we're talking about uh, the completely disrupted climatic situation. Extreme weather events are going to be much more likely. What was a one in a thousand years event is going to be one in hundred or one in ten years. So we're going to get these big fluvial events. The flow, the natural flow in the river is in general less than it was in any case because we're sucking all the water out of the river further up the catchment. The big other big problem is the canalization of the river. The way God created rivers was to have floodplains. So when you have more water, it just spreads across a floodplain. But Norwich, much of Norwich, the river is in a slot. The city council, were very, after 1912, were very focused on flood protection and widening the river. So through much of the city, the river was hugely widened, especially in the Thighbridge area, which is why Thighbridge was rebuilt in the 1930s. But as time rolled on in the 20th century, the need for housing or getting rid of substandard housing and the need for providing for the motor car became the focus. So where we are now, there's no particular worries about flooding and it could, it could well happen, um, in my opinion, um, depending on the freakness of the weather event. Um, but uh, it's one of the many things we're going to have to deal with. High winds is another one. Thanks. Well, um, I think we can um, call it to an end there. Let me just uh, change this. So uh, once again, uh, Matt, thanks very much. Now, uh, Matt has told us about his book, which is available in Gerald's if uh, you mask up and uh, dare to go inside. Uh, but he's also made this kind offer. If you email him, he will uh, arrange a, a delivery of, of, of the book to you. Uh, something which I'm going to take advantage of. Um, also, I should, should tell you that uh, this talk uh, will be available to re-watch as video, or you can recommend to, uh, sorry, as a YouTube uh, video, and you can uh, watch it again or recommend it to, to anybody who think would be interested in it. Uh, we do have a number of uh, videos now on our YouTube channel and uh, it's worth going on to the Norwich Society site and seeing them if you fancy spending an hour 
together with a historian. Uh, one that I would uh, perhaps point out uh, as we approach Christmas is there is one on uh, pantomimes in Norwich over the past 250 years, and that's um, that's one of them. Um, so uh, thanks, <laughs> thanks very much indeed. I don't think any of us before today really got up in the morning and said, I wonder what's happening below the ground. But I think we've all now got um, an interest. And perhaps one last question is, um, what, should we, what should we look out for as we walk in, as we walk through Norwich to see evidence of sewers beneath our feet? Manhole cover? I'm actually recommending becoming obsessed with sewers, but uh, <laughs> uh, I think for me, uh, Norwich, just understanding whether you're walking uphill or downhill, and trying to understand the reasons for that. That tells you an awful lot of the gradients. But in terms of big old covers, um, particularly if you if you look at the map, you'll see where, where the lines of these sewers are. And sometimes on a quiet day, you can hear, hear the water flowing. Mm. If you look where that high level sewer runs into the low level sewer is halfway down King Street. And there's apparently about a dozen granite steps that it's cascading down, all under the ground. There's a whole world down there, Michael. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but don't go lifting any manhole covers. I, uh, mm -hmm. We've got enough urban explorers looking at the medieval. Uh -huh. about that. But uh, there's a lot. There's a lot down there. And as you said before, we just don't even think about. It. We assume it's going to. But it's an absolutely fundamental thing for a modern civilized city to have an effective drainage system. And Norwich had to work really hard because of the geology to make to make it happen. And mm -hmm. I suppose looking further back, you realise for almost almost all of Norwich's history, there was no such thing as a sewage system. We only had it for 150 years. Right. So again, just one further question. I mean, what would it have been like in the 18th century to take a stroll along the river Wensum? Uh, Unpleasant. Uh, when you got the 18th century, I mean, much of it was built up right against, but in medieval times, you weren't even allowed to access the river. There were only a few points where, uh, unless you were a property owner, any points, any few points where the public could ac access the river to do their washing or to get water. Obviously, we had a lot of pumps for water supply anyway, but it was um, it was much narrower. We, we don't appreciate how much the river has been widened. Mm. The irony for me is the most critical bit of the river in terms of widening it as flood prevention was never done. And that's the bit immediately downstream from New Mills. Mm -hmm. That's the most critical bit. Uh, and it's all these days. It's all about resilience, accepting there will be floods, and then building new properties so that, for example, you have the car parking on the ground floor level. So in a way, we sort of thrown in the towel on flood. But but I just think it's an interesting story of priorities in the 20th century, gone from worrying about flooding, from to worrying about substandard housing, uh, having previously worried about disease, uh, right to the point where the most obsession, the biggest obsession in city council was motor traffic. Mm. as epitomized in the 1945 Norwich plan, which foresaw a kind of motor city with everybody. So the idea of flood protection is kind of largely gone now. It's just um, we're even contemplating building hundreds of flats on floodplain down at Trouse, which will be interesting. Mm. OK, well, as I say, thanks. Thanks so much. It's been a very, very interesting talk. And I think uh, all of us will have a much uh, greater feeling for how geology does 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 move history. That's my so, mission. <laughs> so um, to, to everybody, uh, very best wishes for Christmas and the new year. We shall have some more talks uh, in the new year, and we hope you'll join us again. So thank you to Matt. Thank you to everybody.